Hi everyone, it's great to be back again for our second series and today we have a really exciting show to do with vaccines and I've got a brilliant guest called Ripon Ray who will be explaining about his campaign during COVID-19. So as we all know that vaccines are a sensitive topic at currently due to the missive, uh, sorry I'm gonna have to start again. <laughs> it's fine. <laughs> Right. Yeah. Right. So if you go from the top, go Andrea. Andrea. We love you, Andrea. Don't call yeah. it a series episode. Okay. All right. Cool. We love Andrea. Go on. <laughs> right. So, hi everyone. It's great to be back. And uh, got tongue tied there. Get right. some water or something before you start. You're among friends, for God's sake. <laughs> right. Hi everyone, welcome back to our second show. We are here today with the wonderful Rip on Ray and we will be discussing the vaccines. Currently at the moment, there has been a lot of misinformation about how the vaccine works and the benefits of taking the vaccines. And it is causing a lot of you know, discouragement and frustration towards um, ethnic minorities who are currently the most vulnerable group um, during this COVID-19 pandemic. Today, as I said, we are joined with Rip on Ray, and we will be um, listening to what he's been doing during the COVID-19 crisis and the exciting project that he has come up with during this time. So, as I said, I'm now going to pass over to Rip on Ray and Rip on. Could you just please explain to our audience um, how you got into campaigning and where you're from and, um, you know, what you've been up to lately during the COVID-19, please? Um, Andrea, thank you for giving me the chance to kind of share my experience and I hope through that others can might be able to find themselves doing similar kind of thing. Um, before I actually talk about Brit Bangla COVID, which is a campaign around the, the pandemic and how minority communities such as Bangladesh were impacted by uh, the, uh, the disease itself, let me just slide, slide, go slightly back a bit so you, you can understand where I'm coming from. Um, um, I, I've always been a, a campaigner in either one thing or another. And I think uh, just before the lockdown, I was definitely campaigning heavily around universal credit. And uh, my campaign primarily focused around East End of London. Uh, and the reason being was that uh, I knew for a fact that, that, that Bangladeshi communities, from my point of view anyway, uh, were living in overcrowded conditions. Um, child poverty uh, amongst this community is much higher compared to other communities and to be honest on the whole minority communities generally are kind of on the receiving end of any forms of punishment from major institutions and I knew that so my focus in times of austerity and welfare reform was really campaigning against austerity and also against welfare reform. And universal credit is one of the things that reflected a, like a baby of welfare reform and baby of austerity. So my campaign was heavily against universal credit as a result. However, just when the lockdown kicked in, I was prevented from campaigning against universal credit um, and knowing that my background is ethnic minority focus, poverty focus, or anti-poverty focus, I then lashed onto another subject in, in the context of lockdown, and of course, most importantly, COVID, because I knew for a fact that minority communities are going to get hard hit by it, but the question is, how am I gonna justify that? So first thing I did is literally look within my own family, family setting. So I was asking my, my parents, what's going on? Uh, what have you heard about the pandemic and the COVID? And first thing my dad said to me is that your neighbor or my neighbor died of COVID. So then I thought, okay, what's, what's this all about? So, okay, obviously it, it, it was early stage at the time. So I thought, okay, whilst I'm kind of hearing this, how can I document such story? 
So then I started documenting such stories by literally interviewing people on Zoom of my colleagues, of my neighbours, everyone I know, and then every community activist I've come across who I know. Again, one thing after another, I was just getting horror stories whose loved one has died, whose loved one has lost his job as a result of the pandemic. And, and this is it really. So then from then on, I set up a website and as you can see behind me, all these stickers, these are the individuals I interviewed, basically. From April 2020, I've been interviewing so many people. They're not all, by the way, but it's all because of uh, my campaign against Universal Credit Stop, I needed to find another route to archive the stories of minority communities since I'm Bangladeshi. I said to myself, let me just dig deep into my community. And this is how Great Final Code came in, whereby I captured stories of Bangladeshis who have lost their loved ones, who have lost their jobs. And of course, as time went on, it just, it just led to one thing to another, really. And here I am. Yeah, so you um, brought up the Bangladeshi community. What was their response to your campaign initially? Were, was it positive? Was it negative? Like, could you explain a bit more, please? Um, usually, um, it wouldn't surprise me that uh, from an outsider's perspective, Bangladeshis are seem to be quite internal, i.e. Um, think within themselves and uh, don't talk to others. When I approach, I suppose, my own community, I guess, what was interesting is that they easily embraced my campaign. I did not come across anyone who was not willing to share his story about uh, what was going on in their lives. There were a few who were hesitant, but that's fine. I've changed their names and everything else. But on, but on the whole, they were glad that someone was there listening to their stories. Um, some of them felt as though our stories are not heard, but even though they're heard, they're not told by, from those who are within the community. There was an outsider. I mean, so, so I think there was, I think there was a great... A great can you hear me? Hello? Hello? Yeah, so yeah, I so thought, I on, thought the heart, on the heart, sending an echo, an echo of my own voice. Oh, okay. I can hear you. Okay. So that's it really. On the whole, I thought the response from this community has been overwhelming, very supportive. And I think uh, as time went on, I think uh, many people actually lashed onto the campaign, lashed onto the website. So I feel as I'm in a privileged position to be in, to be honest, to carry that banner on behalf of Bangladesh in Britain. Yeah, you've, been, you've done amazing work, Zipon. So in terms of where you are at now, what's been going on currently within your family? I mean, in terms of campaign, there, there, there are a number of folds, i.e. Um, there are a number of strand. I mean, it, when I first started, I had no clue I would be here where I am. Um, at first, it was primarily about storytelling. Um, mm -hmm. So doing podcasts and YouTube videos and also doing like a, a, I suppose, education related campaign to prevent people not breaking the lockdown and those sort of things. Or during Ramadan, I did like, please, 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 I know it's tough for you guys. Please stay at home for the sake of your family. And also in terms of Eid, exactly the same thing please stay home and don't visit your loved ones i know it's tough so it's for campaign focus those sort of things but i realized i needed to do more because i needed to get people together because the whole um, lockdown was about making sure you stay in your home so how do i change the narrative to get people together whereby they're talking among themselves so this is where the public zoom meeting came in where either activists, campaigners, uh, charity workers wanted to share the experience or build bridges with other individuals or organization. And I wanted to support them to build a platform. And those public meetings I have like once every month and stuff allowed them to kind of, kind of I suppose, get together and talk about issues that really bothered them. And so, so that's the other thing is organizing public meeting. And the third thing I did, because I was coming across too many stories of individuals who've lost their loved ones, I thought, how can I capture data that will kind of demonstrate what our others have said to me? This is how I, I did a survey completed by just over 80 people, but focused primarily on Bangladeshis who may have lost their loved ones or who know who have lost their loved ones. So those are the criteria. 
And again, to my surprise, um, 80 people have completed the survey. And what I've understood uh, was that firstly, those people who have died, their literacy rate is very low. So in other words, the literacy rate is below GCSE level. Mm. And, and we all know, Andrea, a lot of people who have died initially were the, who are elderly. Mm. And that was kind of obvious as well. And the third thing that was interesting is that um, most of them were living in overcrowded condition. So really those are the things that I captured, although it's kind of well known that this community is heavily impacted by it, but at least I've got something to, to show to either local authorities, local councillors, MPs that I knew. So literally I applied everyone, um, the report that I found, whether they want to do something about it or not, that's pretty much up to them, but at least I've done my job through Brit Bangla like COVID. So those are the things that I did is storytelling and podcast YouTube, YouTube videos, um, public meetings, and naturally the report that, were, that I promoted to all the um, London boroughs dealing with minority questions. That's absolutely brilliant, um, Ripon. You've done amazing work and you've also managed to, you know, bring out other issues that are concerning the community as well in terms of overcrowded housing and, you know, it's brought up, you know, what we all know, to be honest, yeah. which is, ethnic minorities are, are most affected by this virus. And obviously, you know, having people in the community as yourself who are um, bringing these issues up in terms of the safety of vaccines, this has really helped. And you are pretty much helping people to um, save lives as well. So in terms of the media, how do you think the role of the media has played in, in this um, issue with the vaccines? I think vaccine and minority question, in fact, I, I'm part of a number of um, kind of BAME forums, about five BAME forums. Um, and I've asked the question around uh, vaccine um, and I actually received conflicting answers. But in terms of, from my perspective, I think uh, when the mainstream media argues for vaccine, it's always gonna be slightly abstract. And I think you may not be able to connect because as you probably know, Andrea, when you look at uh, uh, the headlines around BBC, ITV and Sky, all this stuff, they will say, yes, minorities are not taking the vaccine. Um, oh, and you must take the vaccine. So it's like being the enforcer. Mm -hmm. or, and if you don't comply, you're bad. But the thing is, even when I did the report, is that you can't have one size fits all policy, especially upon minority communities, because we respond to different things. We even watch TV that is that 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 is similar to what we what or similar to our skin color. You mm -hmm. see, so you, to connect, you need the local people to get involved. So I feel as a mainstream media isn't actually helping that much, and sometimes it ends up blaming the minority communities. Mm -hmm. So I thought in this case, how can I reach out to the community that I'm familiar with because I've been working on it for some time. Mm -hmm. So I, I decided to make it more proactive rather than just reactive. Mm -hmm. And sometimes I believe the best way to make it more effective is empower that community. And the way you do that is by, as we're saying, we want us to be prioritized than the white population. Mm -hmm. So that is a big thing to say, because we now we are saying is that we, data shows that minority communities that are dying you can't then say, oh, let's vaccinate all together. No, in order to create a true equal society, you have to prioritize on those who are more vulnerable. So therefore the first campaign I had around vaccination is to argue that minority communities ought to prioritize. And I knew for a fact, it's gonna be horrible for, uh, and also I'll get criticized. Most white people I know have criticized me for that on various COVID-19 WhatsApp group. But those who have defended that campaign are minority individuals. Mm. 
And that's what I wanted is to energize minority communities to make sure they feel em empowered, they could argue on their, on their feet and they could challenge it because data already shows that minority communities are hard hit, but how do you do that? And that's why I said to myself, the best way to do with it is empowering minority communities by saying, let them argue for minority first because we know minorities are first to die we know that minority communities are also at the forefront of being a public worker, you know, social worker, care worker, and all those things. So they need to be protected more. So therefore, one side fits all policy isn't gonna work, therefore prioritize on minority communities. That's one of the things that I did among many things around vaccine. Thank you, Ripon. So in terms of people that are not so keen on taking the vaccine, what would you advise people to um, do in terms of finding out information on it and stuff? I think uh, obviously uh, we, we all must accept the fact that we need to come out of the situation. Now, best thing is for now, knowing that the medical evidence is there to show that vaccines do work. So we do have to take the vaccine. But the interesting thing is for a lot of minority communities, by the way, I know the black communities are not taking, uh, are not going for vaccine more compared to the Asian, I can see that. However, it is perhaps because I personally think uh, um, if you dig deeper into it, there are other factors play a part. And I think uh, we need to demystify the importance of vaccines and also state that even if we do take the vaccine, we still have to protect ourselves by making sure social isolation is still complied with because the, uh, the long-term effect of vaccine isn't clear yet, so we need to be sensible. But at the same time, temporary outcome is very effective for now with Pfizer, um, the vaccine, 98%, uh, with AstraZeneca, um, uh, slightly low, however, it's proven to be working. So therefore we need a temporary way to deal with that whilst we have proper um, safeguards in place, which we will find moving forward. But for now, you must take it, but at the same time, that is not the only thing you must take. You must also comply with social distancing rule, uh, as well as making sure you stay in isolation for, uh, for a very long time because this problem isn't going to be going away even if you take the vaccine. Spot on, Ripon. So in terms of um, the future for your campaign, what actions will you be taking and where will you be going with it? I think, so. I mean, obviously there's a limit to how much a, a person can do. I've got, that, that, I've got a full-time job. So all those things I'd be doing in my spare time. So I think uh, um, I, I will carry on doing the campaigns that I've been doing. I'll carry on doing the stories telling that I've been doing. I'll be, I mean, and I think uh, I'll carry on telling the stories and vaccine, but it's not gonna be where I'm gonna say, you must, you must, you must do that. But I think I, I, I will happy to share the stories whereby a lot of people has taken it and the impact of taking has been, but at the same time, become the archivist of Bangladeshi community in Britain during COVID-19. And with, with La the Labour Party, what do you feel that the Labour Party should be doing in terms of the vaccination? So should they be, you know, campaigning more towards um, Black, black groups or Asian groups as well? Or should they, you know, what should they be doing? I mean, don't forget, Labour Party currently has a campaign, Vaccinate mm. the Nation. That's great, fantastic to hear it. I think we also need to do more. And I think, again, if you go along with the fact that one size fits all does not work, we have to make sure minority communities are carrying the banner in their own way. I, if it's about just top down, that I personally think it will only lead to failure and lead to conflict because we don't think alike. And I think on the whole, when it comes to Labour Party and moving forward, in my opinion anyway, I think here is a perfect chance for a Labour Party to show its strength because the way things are going, I'm worried that the Conservative Party will appear more left-wing than the Labour Party. <laughs> so, that, so that is a problem, unfortunately, because they think about it. It's the Labour Party after the Second World War developed 
a welfare state, develop um, the health, national health service, develop the benefit system, develop the social care system, develop free education. And I think what we need is those sort of things needs to be um, argued for again in times of COVID because the way COVID is going, I'm afraid, it is a bit like a, a, a war situation. So we can't respond uh, as though this is not a war. So therefore, I personally think, here's the chance of the Labour Party to be more dynamic and more radical and go beyond just vaccine. But we need to think about restructuring of our national welfare system, housing system, and the benefit system, and no doubt, national health system. And in terms of medical advice do you feel that um you know it's appropriate for all all languages because currently i've seen that um there's a lack of um translation when it comes to the medical advice and stuff so people may be missing out on the stats and facts of what's going on with the vaccine so i just wanted to hear your point of view on this i think uh, i mean uh, interesting now I, I was actually talking to someone who uh, who has who runs a kind of minority charity in south london and that person said that um, I'm worried because it uh, looks like the National Health Service isn't uh, producing data on, on a specific ethnic basis. And we're not quite sure why. And I think uh, in order for uh, us to properly understand the severity of, let's say, COVID upon minority communities, we do need to see proper data. And the data isn't out yet. And hopefully, this, uh, this will give us a, a light as to what is actually happening. However, when it comes to the Labour Party, I think all other parties, including the Labour Party, ought to be adjusting itself to make sure it meets the need of minority communities. Mm -hmm. And uh, that means pr producing leaflets to accommodate specific communities who are hard to reach. Last thing you want is to, for you to come out coming across as though you are the elitist, whilst those who are dying, unfortunately, if they can't understand English, come on, make a reasonable adjustment to fit the, your purpose. And at the same time, the outcome would be, you will get more voters. Absolutely, of course, because you're connecting. Exactly, it's the same with like um, deaf people as well, and those that um, that are sign language as well. There's just you know constantly on on Twitter or or on Facebook, you're seeing them complaining about the fact that these things are not made accessible for them. So this could also be an issue as well in terms of engagement for um, you know our, our communities. To be honest, but however, rip on. How can what actions? Can activists be taken now in terms of um, the vaccines? So, say for example, if um, somebody's new to vaccines and you know all the horrors and um, yeah. you know, you know the stuff that's happened in the past and stuff. How would you encourage them to get involved in you know campaigning on the safety of it and um, just bringing more awareness about the vaccines? Also, a number of factors. I think uh, um, actually having had a conversation with a number of minority communities, it seems, yes, there are those who need persuading. So we need to think about what sort of information would persuade them. That's one thing we need to know. Now there is another issue, even though some individuals are persuaded by it, the question is, do they have the drive and the motivation and resource to get to the vaccination center? Yeah. So physically going there and mm -hmm. think about it, if you're on low income, you have to go a long way to take a bus and you pay for the travel expenses, otherwise you won't get there. How can we support the individual to go there? So this is where I personally think if you have a COVID-19 group which supports individuals who needs to get there but doesn't have the transport to go there or means to go get there, we need to find a, 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 I guess, a fundraising, um, a, a pot that allows minority communities to go there without putting that restrictions. Um, and the other thing is maybe a reminder. Um, so a part, whilst you take away the argument for and against and you persuaded the person, and if there are issues about physically getting there, is there any way you can find a way to make sure proactively the activists and the campaigners can assist them to go there and get vaccinated and then job done? Because some people um, would go, others 
can't go or won't go, if you don't help them, then you can definitely get the numbers up. Ripon, what did you think of um, the video with uh, the Conservative and Labour MPs, the black ones? What, did, what was your response to that? Did you think it was a good thing or was it a bit like leave it? Andrea, I'm being honest with you, I did not see that one. <laughs> I didn't see that one. Oops. But you know, at least, at least you... but, yeah, um, I, I suggest you go and have a look at it. <laughs> okay. You may get some um good guidance from it. But um yeah, it it I don't think it really had the impact that um that they were after. That's just my thoughts on it and cool. my um thoughts from others that I have um got feedback from. Mm. So um in terms of you know We'll go back to the media and stuff because there has been um, controversy over the weekend. And um, it was aimed at a black um, journalist. Um, she was actually um, pinpointed by the equalities minister. So the equalities minister got at her because um, she basically questioned her on why she wasn't in this video. And um, yes, the Equalities Minister um, responded by doing an eight um, tweets, doing eight tweets, just basically targeting this journalist and calling her petty and crazy. And yeah, I just um, wanted to, you know, hear your thoughts on, on these things. Do you think it's wrong for journalists to ask ministers um, their, why they refuse to um, participate in, in a video that benefits the black community um yes because if uh, the pillar of our democratic uh, system is having uh, accountability um journalism is uh, an aspect of making sure ministers are kept in check so obviously the journalist journalist has the right to ask the question and i think if the question isn't being asked i think we're letting the uh, the minister um go so it, wherever there is um, uh, a democracy, you expect checks and balance. So just to kind of simplify your answer, of course, the journalist has the right to ask the question. And so Ripon, um, you told us um, what activists can do, but mm -hmm. just tell us what you're going to be doing in the future. It doesn't have to be vaccine related, but just yeah. let us know in terms of campaigning wise, what you'll be yeah. doing. Andrea, I, I thank you for allowing me this. Um, you probably know this. Um, there are a number of other problems this pandemic uh, uh, is causing. Um, one of the thing is people are losing the jobs. I mean, I mean, we, people are losing the jobs. Uh, people are claiming benefits. We have seen uh, more universal credit claimants uh, in the last year than the than the um, than when universal credit came about. So obviously, the number of universal credit claim claimants uh, are just going rocket up. So the question is where can they seek information and advice um, for their own benefit? So to help local communities out, I'm going to go on radio every Wednesday between six and eight, primarily to advise people on their money problems, debt problems and benefit problems. Um, if there are queries related with your credit reference agencies, mortgage arrears, rent arrears. So you can find me on Relax Radio between six and eight. And just, uh, just if you don't know, by the way, um, I've been doing radio stuff and benefit stuff and advice stuff for over eight, nine years. That's kind of in my blood, really. So just to kind of help out people in terms of the pandemic, that's what I'm doing. And the other thing I want to talk to you about it's really the public meeting uh, organised by Brit Bangla COVID on the 7th of February at 3pm. I've sent you the link anyway. Um, where, again, really, is getting people together to talk about I issues that are impacting minority communities. So the subject matter is migrant and refugees under COVID. I got a um, representative of the United Nations talk about the international issues, campaigners from Move for Justice talking about how they have campaigned around detainees and, and, and of course other local activists and as you can see yeah and also representative of um, the curry network and um, Muslim will be talking about um, how the waiters and restaurateurs have been impacted by it and of course Pierre Merklov he he represents bail for immigration detainees so really they're all different types of activists and campaigners and representatives are going to be taking part so I hope you can attend and uh, that's on the 7th and finally 
um, you probably have realized that my specialism seem to be Bangladeshis. <laughs> yeah, and, and, and in March, um, so I guess next month, um, they, uh, it's the 50th anniversary of formation of Bangladesh. It's a big event um, whereby it gained independence from West Pakistan. And prior to it, uh, Bangladesh was part of colonial India. So I've been giving series of talks on history of Bangladesh and my uh, background, by the way, I'm a history graduate in history. It's predominantly wrote history of Bangladesh and then postgraduate in Bengal history. So that's my background anyway, in terms of academia. So I, did, I decided to share my knowledge to local communities by looking at it kind of a more social, more pol you know, policy focused, economic data focused, and also um, impact you had in local communities and conflict that you're seeing. So those are some of the things that I'm doing, and I hope if you can attend, please do and pop along. Yeah, it sounds, it sounds good, Ripon. Like you're doing, you're doing an absolute amazing job with um, the Bangladeshi community, and you're an absolute credit to your community as well. And I, I just want to thank you for coming on the show today and um, talking about your experiences and the stuff that you've been doing for vaccines as well, as it's a very important issue and it's a sensitive one as well. Like I've you know, like I've said to you, like a lot of people are very defensive on this issue, like especially those that aren't taking it. And there's, you know, so much work to bring bring awareness of um, the benefits of taking vaccines and obviously the pros and cons of taking it as well. But we've also got to be mindful that some people do have genuine fears. And I just believe that we have to, um, you know, be mindful of this and also consider how they're feeling and take on what they're saying on board as well. So we can help them to make an informed decision on where they want to um, go with taking the vaccine. So Ripon, it's been an absolute pleasure. We will, of course, put all of your social media plugs online for you. And um, hopefully you can come back and update us on more of your campaigning work. It will be an absolute pleasure to have you back on again. It's been a brilliant show. Thank you. Thank you. So now we are going to move over to Akua from Labour Black Socialists, who's going to give us a brilliant update of what's been going on during the campaign. Thank you, Andrea. And oh, yet another really good show. Um, it really shows how important, isn't it, why um, we have uh, Black Socialists contributing, giving our contribution to this debate. Um, uh, it's interesting when um, Ripon was saying how, how a neighbour died so early in the pandemic. It was the same for me. An elder from the Somali community living next door uh, died in March. And it's just, I noticed it was like suddenly there was a split between people who were, who were talking about the pandemic coming. And for those of us for whom it came and it had arrived, it arrived on our doorsteps. Mm -hmm. um, and it also, I think, feeds, and I'm going to talk about the, the campaign that we're looking at at the moment for an actively anti-racist Labour Party. And I think it evidences why it's so important. Um, the Labour Party has a really active and involved black membership. We're members of the Labour Party. We we're also, as Ripon evidences so clearly, and as you do, I know with the work you do, we're also very involved in our communities. Uh, and the Labour Party should be actually mobilising that membership. And one of the ways they can do that is every candidate who we are being asked to elect should be talking to their black members about what are those issues. So in terms of vaccinations, the first point of call, which I think Rio Ripon was referring to, is to get those candidates out talking to their membership who are active. Um, I also think this issue around vaccinations and the way the press are sort of blowing up the reluctance for our communities to vac be vaccinated is important, not just for our communities, but actually for working class communities across the country. Because the reason that we distrust, or there is, or there has been some distrust, needs to be looked at really clearly. This is because we've been systemically at the receiving end of poor health care, poor social care. You know, I, um, I'm an artist, as you know, a freelancer, so I top up my income as I can. And one of the things is volunteering for uh, studies where I think they're safe. And so often, I couldn't participate in a study because I was black and they were their norm who they're looking for are, were white participants. So the data that was being gathered, our community is distrustful and we need to get over that. We need to really push the scientific evidence and why this is being done so quickly is because so many 
scientific communities around the world are pooling their knowledge. So, I mean, there is some really clear information, and I'm sure Ripple will be looking at that, and other activists. So in whatever area people are in, talk to your activists. So where are we? Um, I just wanted to share some of the st statistics, and um, might as well how we're doing in the campaign, because the campaign has been really popular. A lot of traction. Um, I'm going to just bring up our Instagram uh, account. Um, let me do that as ever. Uh, and I'm just looking for some of the statistics that have, so here we go, evidence. I love to evidence things, as you know. So this is um, the television show that we did to launch the campaign, uh, supported by Howard Beckett on Socialist Telly. And as you can see there, we are already up to 33.5 thousand views. And so we are working so hard to get the message out. And thank you to everyone who's seen that, because the response we've had back has been amazing. Uh, we've got emails, we've had questions, people wanting the motion, wanting to see the statement, pushing it through their branches, pushing it to their unions. Absolutely fantastic. I'm going to try with this, you know, skipping around. Oh, no, don't do that. How do I? Yeah, before, how do I you move move on, before you move on, yeah. Yeah. why do I look like I'm, I'm looking, I'm just looking into, you know, thin air? And I believe that it makes you look, Andrea, that you are deeply thoughtful and reflecting on, I think it's Ma Maurice who's speaking at this point, and you are thinking about the wisdom of his words and how you can add to that and share with that. And he's probably just said at that moment, I agree with Andrea. And you're like, of course he does. That's well, what that, I think. Maurice, Maurice is just rambling on. And you, you're just sitting there happy. And Howard just looks like he's... I'm hidden underneath. So let me see what else we've got that I can share in terms of statistics. So this is on your show. There we go. Are you ha any happier with this screenshot, Andrea? Yeah. Andrea's got a yeah, so lot to get used to. to talk. I'm ready to talk and ready to get active, man. Absolutely. Um, and getting used to seeing your face out there. I mean, the work yeah, you've had right. eight years when you were talking on this show. This, this is the last show uh, that went out and it got 11,000 views. Absolutely fantastic, people. Yeah. Watch this, share this amongst your comrades. This show about vaccinations equally important. And I hope you're going to give a plug for the next show, Andrea, as well. But um, so on this show, we've got 11.3 thousand views, which is absolutely fantastic. This is the place where people can come now to hear what the issues are, to hear from black socialists from the Labour Party and beyond. Our networks are, we are networked into our communities uh, and hopefully we'll be bringing in experts from across our communities to talk about the issues that are relevant to our communities, but therefore to the country as a whole, to the Labour Party as a whole, to socialists within the Labour Party as a whole. Um, yeah, it's one of my favourites. Let's see what else we can find. I feel like I'm going into some blind uh, lucky dip. So this was... Uh, responding to um, this is the petition. So I think it's really important that we can highlight the petition. Hopefully that link can go in uh, in the show as well when it comes in. It will be down there. Uh, yeah. Link to the petition. Um, and this is just the title. So you, you know, obviously everyone knows how they can reach uh, petition.gov.uk and actually get there and sign this in, this petition. It's really important. Uh, it was, um, who was that amazing activist who, who put that together? Oh, yes, Andrea Gilbert. Fantastic. <laughs> oh, you're um, funny. Let me see, because now you guys are in the way of which there are. Ah, that's better. So is there any ones that I wanted to specifically share with you? We've got that. Um, okay, I'm going to get a little, I, a little vanity. I quite like this one. This was from uh, Barnett, so uh, Labour uh, members, I think possibly Momentum. Excellent discussion with Andrea Gilbert to Maurice McLeod, plus the ever so eloquent and recently NEC candidate Akua by you. I'll come off there quickly, but you know why I have to share that. So go to our social media. There's a lot of information. Uh, it keeps you up to date. The campaign's going really well. This is a really useful part of it, but it's only here to inspire everybody to actually see how can you become actively anti-racist. Find out, get informed, get involved. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Akua. Akua, you're, you're inspiring me. Oh, fantastic. Yeah. Thank you. Ripple, oh. I hope you're joining the campaign, you know. Of course I will. Good stuff. Right, guys, I have enjoyed today. It has been an absolute pleasure. Ripon, I will be dragging you back onto the show. So looking forward to having you back on again. And obviously we'll be hearing from um, Akua 
next week again. So for next week's show, I will give you a little preview. It will be on domestic violence, and we're going to be joined up with um, with three or four speakers next week, hopefully. So we're going to be moving up, and we're going to be hearing from Black and Asian um, women on domestic violence. I'm really, really looking forward to this show, and I hope all of you beautiful people will join me next week. Thank you. And